Prevention Program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. And I'm very pleased um, at this opportunity to moderate a panel on the nuclear crisis in Northeast Asia for this Asan Plenum. And very pleased that you could all join us here today. Um, let me start very briefly by telling you what this panel is not about. <laughs> this is not about Fukushima. There is another panel about Fukushima. This is not about nuclear weapons in North Korea. Um, it's a little more subtle. It's about how trends in nuclear energy in Northeast Asia, and I would say that includes um, <clears throat> developments in nuclear safety, nuclear security, and non-proliferation, affect our nuclear future. Asia is the one area in the world where we will see growth in nuclear energy. Um, and today we have a very diverse panel. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, nuclear energy trends in South Korea, in China, nuclear regulation, and um, some of the lessons learned for nuclear governance. And the questions that we're going to cover are how nuclear energy moves forward and how choices about directions in nuclear energy, whether you develop sensitive technologies like enrichment or reprocessing or not, affect uh, some of the future trends. Um, I am going to limit my remarks right there so we can get right to our panelists, um, but let me introduce them first. We have Dr. Huang Osun. Um, who will speak first. He is the director of the Nuclear Materials Lab at Seoul National University. He has a background in nuclear and mechanical engineering, widely published, and you hold many patents. So, um, and he's an expert in aging nuclear power plants, nuclear fuel cycle issues, and nuclear safety. After Dr. Huang, we're going to hear from Phil Chafee, who is an assistant editor at Nuclear Intelligence Weekly right now based in New York, but uh, usually I think in London. Um, Phil has a background in journalism and he covers global nuclear fuel markets, uh, uranium mining, non-proliferation, and nuclear energy policies in the US, Asia, and Europe. Um, after Phil, we're gonna hear from Peter Bradford, who is an adjunct professor at the Vermont Law School. Peter is a former commissioner with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission at a time of uh, great turmoil during Three Mile Island. Uh, he's also the former chair of um, the New York and Maine Utility uh, Regulatory Commissions, and he consults uh, widely. He has degrees from Yale University and is on the board of the Union of Concerned Scientists. And um, finally, we'll hear from, uh, lastly, but not, or I forget that one, that phrase, last but not least, I should say. Dr. Scott Sagan, who is the Caroline S.G. Monroe uh, Professor of Political Science at Stanford University um, and a senior fellow at CSAC. He's co-chair of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences project on global nuclear future initiatives. Um, before Stanford, Scott was at Harvard University. Um, he's worked for the Joint Chiefs of Staff and um, has uh, consulted on a wide basis within the U.S. government. Um, he's written a lot. And some of you may be familiar with at least um, his book uh, from 1993, The Limits of Safety. Um, uh, I can't even read my own handwriting. What was the first word? Something accidents in nuclear weapons. Safety organization. <laughs> Sorry, Scott. Um, I am going to leave it right there and invite uh, Dr. Huang to speak for about 10 minutes on trends in green nuclear energy. Thank you, uh, Sharon. Um, in uh, Asia and Middle East, which is a uh, very close neighbor here, um, we will have uh, some uh, step back in nuclear power development. Uh, slowdowns uh, at least. Uh, however, uh, I bet in the next 10 years the nuclear renaissance will fully come back in this part of the world uh, which is in direct contrast to the, the other part. And But we have a, a diagonally 
uh, opposed groups in this uh, Asia and Middle East. You know, those uh, who are still in Cold War era, including India, Pakistan, and Iran, North Korea, and they will keep uh, their way of uh, keeping their military power and uh, trying to build a nuclear arsenal and uh, will become a huge problem in this area. However, the rest of the, uh, the Asian and Middle East countries uh, will try to take the economical development course. And uh, Myanmar recently tried to uh, move from one group to the other group to become prosperous. And in this race of economical growth in Asia, uh, we expect uh, the Asian community will place efficiency as the most important quality, as opposed to safety or security. So in this sense, uh, we we'll try to uh, copy the technological development and infrastructure development uh, from the Western world to reproduce here even with a great efficiency and economy, and which is very essential to the economical growth uh, in the region where uh, energy resource is uh, truly scarce. So uh, with uh, this trend, uh, we will have to uh, find a way to overcome uh, the uh, big risk of black sweat. So how can you do it? Uh, that's the uh, big question in the mind of everybody in this part of the world. This, uh, uh, the community and the continent had been uh, uh, based on uh, Confucius uh, value. And uh, we will be putting higher priority in the uh, the governance and uh, also uh, uh, political power uh, or over the uh, technological uh, uh, perfection. So uh, uh, we worry about the culture issue on safety, also to some extent security. So uh, how can we overcome this uh, cultural barrier to ensure the safety and security will become uh, the common uh, the mandate for all the countries pursuing nuclear power program in Asia and Middle East. The security culture is going to be uh, a, a big issue because we have been living with a lot of uh, the calamities ranging from uh, military uh, clashes to uh, natural disasters, including earthquake and uh, tsunami, and also floodings and the volcanic eruption. Uh, so uh, also, uh, we had a lot of political instabilities, military dictatorships, and which cast a lot of doubts about uh, predictability in personal life, community life. So uh, we believe we have a huge security problem even without nuclear power or nuclear security issues. So we may be desensitized about the security uh, with nuclear uh, materials or nuclear uh, technology because we already are living with too many security problems. It's not a new problem. So in order to uh, handle uh, the cultural issues, we need a strong uh, leadership uh, who can truly uh, keep entire community alert and putting the highest priority to attract uh, the policy makers and also to uh, foster young mind to come to this field. And uh, uh, 
because uh, we have a similar background, a similar cultural uh, history. And there may be some, uh, uh, some hinder side. So we will have to seek some outsider uh, specters or cross examiners to become a part of our uh, leadership so that they can alert, uh, uh, point that we maybe just by mistake or by our uh, uh, history if placed on the negligence can be uh, brought back to uh, the table of important actions. Thank you. I'll, I'll jump right in. Um, China is uh, by far the fastest growing nuclear industry in the world. Um, and when people talk about the nuclear renaissance, the only place it really makes sense is in China. Um, right now, there's 16 operating reactors, which uh, make up for that uh, 12 gigawatts of power. But there's another 26 under construction. And, um, and the current plans, if, if they um, end their post Fukushima halt and um, new reactor approvals, is for some 70 gigawatts or even more, maybe 86 by 2020. It depends on the timing of that, um, which I will get to. But before talking about the, the post Fukushima halt, I just want to talk, set the stage a little with what was going on in the Chinese nuclear industry beforehand. Um, under the surface, even though the whole nuclear industry is government run, there's various um, bureaucrat, there, there have been long bureaucratic battles um, fought, and there's been very high level safety warnings. Um, in 2009, Li Ganji, who's the um, head of the Chinese nuclear safety regulator, the NNSA, he warned about an over rapid expansion of nuclear power. And in January 2011, just before the Fukushima accident, there was a report from the State Council Research Office, which is comparable to the USGAO, which warned that the current momentum threatens the long-term healthy development of nuclear power and gave a number of other um, concrete warnings. So this was all on the agenda before, um, before Fukushima. Um, some of the other uh, struggles the industry was facing. There was some public pushback. Um, one, one interesting example is in Shandong province in northeastern China, right on the coast, there was um, a, a group of uh, newly affluent landowners and um, developers who opposed a nuclear power project um, because just sort of nimbyism. And they effectively made uh, China National Nuclear Corps, the, um, formerly the main um, nuclear utility, shelf the project. Um, beyond that, there are, there are various bureaucratic battles, or there were various bureaucratic battles. Um, China National Nuclear Corps was started as sort of the company that started most of the nuclear program in China. Um, but it has long been struggling against um, China Guangdong nuclear power which is um, at this point developing the most and will be the preeminent nuclear power utility in the country. Um, CNNC, the older one, um, controls the nu domestic nuclear fuel cycle, but both of them import uranium and both of them are, have sort of competing technologies. Um, both were competing with uh, Chinese designed technologies um, and both championed uh, different third generation Western uh, reactor technologies. China Guangdong Nuclear championed the Ariva EPR, of which it's building two in Guangdong, Power, in Guangdong Province in Taishan. And uh, CNNC championed the AP1000, which is built by Westinghouse, owned by Toshiba. Um, in 2006, 2007, the Chinese government selected the AP1000 as a primary model for the future third generation reactor fleet. But the battle wasn't quite ended. I mean, they kept building those EPRs just as a backup plan. Um, there was also a, I wouldn't say conflict, but the, those two utilities are relatively small. The big five utilities in China 
all were trying to push into the nuclear sector, partly to diversify themselves um, away from coal. Um, only one of them, prior to Fukushima, was given the right to, um, to have a majority stake in and operate and manage the construction of a nuclear reactor. That was um, China Power Investment Corps. Um, the other four were still pushing for that. Uh, there was also the debate of when the Chinese government was going to allow inland reactors to start being built, because currently all the reactors under construction and operating are along the coast. Um, and finally, those foreign vendors were, even though they were, you know, they'd signed contracts and they are building their reactors in China, were very concerned about the Chinese legal infrastructure, particularly in regards to liability, where but right now, there's just two statements from the Chinese government that there's no law that's come out of the city council or anything. Um, that also has a scene for Fukushima. The, the immediate reaction after Fukushima um, was pretty dismissive. The Chinese environment minister made statements that we're watching the situation, but this won't change anything. But um, for two reasons. One, Fukushima just got a lot more serious. Um, over the week after um, March 11th, and the, the reaction in China, the public really was freaking out. There was reports of grocery store shelves being stripped of all the salt, um, because people were looking for salt. Um, so on March 16th, the State Council um, and Wen Jiabao led a session, session of the State Council where they uh, issued a, a halt on approvals of new uh, reactor projects, meaning that the, the reactors under construction and two or three reactors that had had final approvals for construction could go forward, but no new approvals would be issued. At the time, they said, this is going to be um, you know, just a temporary measure, and it will last more than a year. But it's now been um, a year and a month, and it's still very unclear when those reactor approval um, will begin again. Um, I think a lot of what's going on, I mean, it's, it's hard to say, it might be connected to the leadership transition in China uh, making a decision on this. Um, but there's a lot, of, a lot of these bureaucratic battles are also playing out. Um, at this point, it looks like the big Chinese utilities will not be able to um, take, a, take the role in nuclear they were looking for, at least for the discernible future. Um, it's unclear what's happened on the, on the legal side. There is some massive Chinese nuclear law that a draft is circulating the government. It's hard to say what's happening. And um, I think the biggest battle may be between, uh, between the, the different generation reactors. China Guangdong had been um, building the, its CPR-1000 reactor, which is derived from French technology, but it's still a second generation reactor. And there are plans for building many more of those. But um, now the question is whether those are safe and whether those planned projects should be switched to AP-1000s um, or potentially another reactor technology. But um, a lot of the long lead items have been ordered, and there's a constant tug of war within the bureaucracy and within the government as to what to do there. Um, I could go on, but that's the general state of play in China right now. Let me just, both, both of you were underneath your 10 minutes. So we get 15, 20 minutes each, right? You can have a lot of time, but, but, but let me, so, so this vision of sort of rampant growth in China, you're not seeing that right now, where it might slow down enough to, for some of the institutions to catch up, would you say? Maybe, I mean, if, Let's say there's no new approvals for the next five years. Um, it would still be, it would still add up to about 40, 40 gigawatts by 2020, which is the official target goal um, of the last five-year plan. It's still a lot more than they have. It's right still now. a lot more than they have, and it would still make them one of the biggest nuclear countries in the world. Um, but it would slow it down considerably from their previous goal. I mean, they were talking 70, 86, 112, all by 2020. So it slows it down dramatically. Um, but, you know, they could issue approvals tomorrow. I don't know the inner workings of the state council and what's happening there. And, and Dr. Huang, Korea is, unlike China, kind of building steadily and still has plans to build steadily. Right. But 
uh, we are not completely free from uh, public backlash. Uh, we have election, presidential election this year, and the uh, leading opposition party um, has uh, promised uh, when they get the power, we roll back the plan for nuclear power development uh, from about 60% of electricity generation by 2030 to about half of the level. So, um, we have some backlash, but uh, the public uh, support for nuclear power is still reasonably sound, but it depends on the uh, ongoing the, uh, investigation on the, some safety troubles, uh, also some uh, corruption issues in nuclear power plants. And it's a test of a trust of public to the nuclear power industry and government. If uh, this thing goes fine, uh, I expect the Korea will be moving on on uh, original plan for nuclear power, which is 60 percent of electric power generation uh, by nuclear by 2030. Do, do you think that this recent change in the regulatory structure is a positive development, whereby in Korea? We, um, we uh, uh, believe this is the right direction to make regulator uh, completely independent from promoters. Mm -hmm. um, but we are still in transition, like uh, what United States had experienced in 1975, right after splitting a uh, regulator from uh, these uh, promoters, that this transition is a very dangerous stage because we have some confusions and uh, some aberration on the uh, governance. And so um, this year is very important for Korean nuclear uh, industry. It will be a real test for some regulator and uh, generators, as well as R&D sectors. Whether or not Korean nuclear uh, power uh, community can, uh, can uh, regain public support to uh, uh, pull through our plan. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a perfect segue <laughs> into Peter's um, talk about some of the lessons that the United States learned. Yeah, in fact, let me just start with, with your question, uh, just to observe that the growth rates that are being talked, even being, the maximum growth rates being talked about in, in China are considerably less than the growth rates that the U.S. dreamed of back in the 60s and 70s. The official target of our Atomic Energy Commission in 1972 was to have a thousand nuclear plants by the year 2000. Uh, in fact, uh, of course, we have only a hundred, um, and we canceled about as many as we built. So, about 250 were actually planned and ordered during the 1960s and 70s, even though only a hundred were built. Um, uh, a lot of our nuclear industry's problems are traceable to that overly rapid pace of growth. And let me use that as a sort of bridging observation back into uh, my, the topic of my talk, which is leadership in nuclear decision making. Because in hindsight, it's clear that the wisest leadership would have said, we have to slow down. We can't handle this rate of growth. We can't regulate effectively. We can't build them effectively. We can't assure the quality. Uh, and what actually happened was that many things went wrong even before Three Mile Island. The industry was in a great deal of economic difficulty. Plans were being canceled. But it was a career-ending move in the nuclear industry or at the Atomic Energy Commission to 
suggest that things were going too fast, that particular types of uh, programs or plants should be should not be uh, licensed or should be postponed. Uh, so people tried instead to adjust and accommodate the people who got ahead in career terms were the ones who said we can to do this. And it's only in hindsight that it's clear what real leadership would have consisted of uh, during those years. Um, now, the two areas I want to talk about are the, the two types of governance challenges uh, that the U.S. industry is facing now, and I want to do it in a way that, uh, that makes the U.S. experience kind of a lens that is useful uh, for purposes of, of this conference. Um, I'm going to talk mostly about safety regulation, but I want to talk a little also about the uh, economic choices we make and what types of, of plants get built uh, in the U.S. Um, and how the country goes about choosing um, my own experience, as Sharon said, begins with uh, being on the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in the late 1970s and early 80s. The accident at Three Mile Island was in 1979. And one of the things that has struck me in the last year are some of the differences between the U.S. approach to the Three Mile Island accident in comparison to the approach to Fukushima. Um, Three Mile Island, we now know, was a much less serious accident than Fukushima in uh, terms of damage, release radiation, uh, the health implications. Um, but you wouldn't know that if you looked at it uh, in terms of the U.S. reaction. Uh, after Three Mile Island, um, well, first of all, just a, a, a quick story. Um, in the months after Three Mile Island, uh, a number of countries visited the Three Mile Island uh, the site. I don't know if Korea did, but certainly the Soviet Union uh, did and Japan did. Um, and they said, well, uh, it's a serious accident, but it can't happen in our country. We don't have the Babcock and Wilcox design. Uh, nothing like that will happen to us. Well, they were right, of course. The, mm -hmm. That type of accident did not happen. But the <laughs> Soviet Union then had uh, Chernobyl, and again, the world said, well, that's a unique design. The Soviet safety culture <coughs> terrible. That won't be repeated in our country. And again, the world was right about, uh, about that, too. Um, uh, but clearly, wise safety leadership uh, it cuts deeper than just looking at the technical specifics of individual uh, accidents. And in the years, in the, in the months after Three Mile Island, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission closed all of the plants of the Babcock and Wilcox uh, design for a period of months to make sure that the flaws that were shown by Three Mile Island were ones that the operators were trained to handle and uh, that they stayed within conditions that assured against the repeat of the accident. The commission also stopped licensing uh, new plants for a period of about 18 months. It never actually used the word moratorium, but we all knew that uh, we weren't going to be issuing new licenses until such time as the lessons of, of Three Mile Island uh, had been incorporated in our regulations. We had a presidential commission um, uh, called the Kemeny Commission that investigated the accident from the standpoint of the implications for uh, not only the chronology of what happened, but the implications for nuclear regulation, for the federal government's nuclear programs, for the nuclear industry itself. It was a, a serious investigation, full access to all information, depositions under oath, uh, and uh, it produced a very comprehensive report. The NRC commissioned a separate group to in specifically to investigate the Nuclear Regulatory Commission uh, and report uh, without limitations on what shortcomings they found in our regulation. The Congress did two investigations. Um, 
the end result was an extensive revision of our nuclear regulatory practices. The nuclear industry examined itself and developed a separate uh, quasi-regulatory body of its own, non-governmental, uh, called the Institute for Nuclear Power Operations, in order to make sure that even the weakest of operators was adhering to acceptable standards that did not jeopardize uh, the U.S. nuclear fleet in the future. So very fundamental introspection and changes. Now, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission today, in the wake of Fukushima, is doing a serious analysis, has done a serious analysis of the technical aspects of the Fukushima accident, and they are undertaking to put a number of technical reforms into place. Um, but they're not doing the kind of analysis that they might require of a licensee uh, who had a serious event of its own, that is a root cause analysis, when they find shortcomings in the U.S. regulatory framework as uh, a result of the Fukushima accident, um, when they find shortcomings of what's in place at the plants, they aren't looking behind that at events that might shed some light on the regulatory shortcomings that allowed it to come into being. And let me just give one example. The NRC received a petition several years ago from a group of scientists saying that additional safety precautions were necessary to protect spent fuel pools against potential loss of, uh, of coolant. Um, not only did the commission not entertain that petition in a serious way, but one of the commissioners asked the NRC staff to prepare a study not to evaluate this petition, but to discredit it. Um, and when our National Research Council undertook a separate evaluation of the issue, the NRC engaged it in a dispute over what information should or shouldn't be made public and prevented its release for nearly a year. Um, now, the Commission has now agreed that improved spent fuel pool protections are necessary but no one is looking back six or seven years ago and asking why didn't uh, we take this petition seriously uh, at the time? What is it institutionally about the way we looked at the issues raised by this petition? Um, now, uh, it would be a mistake, though, to conclude that the collapse of what had been thought to be a nuclear renaissance in the U.S. three or four years ago is in any way traceable to Fukushima. Um, the hope for new nuclear plants in the U.S. had already run afoul of the fact that their economics were fundamentally unfavorable. Um, the U.S. system is now divided. About half the country uses competitive power markets to choose new capacity. Half uses the old model in which regulators approve construction and the customers then have to pay the costs. All of the plants in the power market regions, the proposed new plants, have been canceled. Uh, they simply cannot compete with low gas prices and the drop-off in demand resulting from the uh, recession. Plus, their own cost estimates have, <coughs> have gone up. Um, the four plants that are actually making some progress are all in the regulated regions and they are all making progress only because the two states involved have committed the customers to put up the money in advance uh, to handle the costs of, of, uh, of financing them. So it's clear from the U.S. experience that in countries with a profile like the U.S., and I'll say more about that in a second, new nuclear is not going to be competitive, especially with natural gas, for a long time and not many new plants are in prospect. The characteristics that do support new nuclear seem to be the characteristics that obtain more in this part of the world. High growth, limited access to gas, strong centralized decision making that's strongly committed to supporting nuclear power. It is helpful but not essential to have also policies that uh, would charge for carbon emissions. Um, what does this tell us about nuclear leadership? 
Uh, well, let me just make two points. First, nuclear safety requires a method of making decisions that will produce safe results practically 100% of the time. And this is an expensive and it's sometimes a disruptive process. But in the wake of nuclear accidents, like most other serious accidents, there will always be a trail. There will always be a trail consisting of memos that warned against this type of event, memos that for one reason or another were inconvenient, were disregarded, were shunted aside. And there will always be people whose careers were damaged by warning against events of the type that actually occurred and persisting in those warnings to the point where they came to be regarded as a nuisance. So it's important for a country in furthering its safety culture to ask itself again and again, do we really want wise nuclear leadership and are we following practices that actually reward the raising of serious concerns? Uh, it's not enough just to fix the technical problems as they uh, appear. And the second principle uh, that I put forth is that sound regulatory principles, whether economic or safety, are much more important than prophecies. Uh, that an easy way for an economic or a safety agency to get into trouble is to focus on prophecies, to think that it can foretell the future, that in 10 or 20 or 30 years we will need this many plants, uh, that the worst conditions from a safety standpoint that can occur are X, Y, and Z, and therefore we don't have to guard against anything beyond those specified uh, uh, sets of events. Um, if we can get the principles right, we don't have to worry so much about the prophecies, but we can be sure that we won't get the prophecies right, whether they're as to demand or as to worse conditions that can occur, and that's why a focus on principles is so fundamental. Thank you so much. Scott, you have the floor. I'm going to try to make three points in the ten minutes that uh, we have been given by our appropriately draconian chairwoman uh, to make sure we have lots of time for questions and comments. So the three points are first, that we face and will continue to face a very serious challenge uh, in nuclear safety, security, and safeguards uh, as the world becomes, has the spread of nuclear power because of the political and social characteristics of aspiring nuclear power states. Point two, that the international control of plutonium reprocessing and uranium enrichment remains the key, and that can only be handled more appropriately, in my judgment, if we have a reconceptualization of the Non-Proliferation Treaty so that non-nuclear weapon states take as part of their Article VI commitment to work in good faith towards nuclear disarmament to include to work in good faith towards international control of plutonium reprocessing and uranium enrichment. And three, that we have severe security challenges post Fukushima and post the Nuclear Security Summit here because security of nuclear materials is a lot more than reducing uranium, uh, highly enriched uranium around the world. So those are my three key points. So first, I don't know who's going to get nuclear power in the future. The countries involved don't know. The IAEA doesn't know. The IAEA estimates range from 90 at the lowest number of new nuclear power plants to be built by 2030 at the low projection to about 350, which is almost a doubling of the current international fleet by 2030. But there are some 40 states that have asked the agency for technical assistance in acquiring nuclear power in the future, despite the Fukushima accident. Now, many people will look at those countries individually or look at the regional spread, more in Asia, more in the Middle East, less in Europe, etc. And I think that's useful, but what's more important from a safety, security, and safeguards perspective is to look at their political characteristics. So in 2009, they published a, a study in Douglas that's available on the American Academy of Arts and Sciences website that simply looks at new nuclear, aspiring nuclear power states, comparing them to existing nuclear power states politically. 
by looking at World Bank measurements of control of corruption, political stability, government effectiveness, regulatory quality, and democracy versus autocracy scores. And in every one of those, the aspiring nuclear states on average score worse. Lower in control of corruption, lower in political stability, lower in government effectiveness, lower in regulatory quality, which is a World Bank measure, not in the nuclear area, just in general, and lower in terms of democracy. And that's important. And Fukushima, if you look at the countries that have dropped out, Germany, Switzerland, potentially Japan, only makes these trends look worse. So I think we have a severe problem. Countries who are trying to get nuclear power are more corrupt, have more corruption, and corruption is related both to safety violations and security violations. Virtually every case of nuclear smuggling, you'll find corruption playing a part of it, and corruption clearly is a problem in potential selling of, of materials or potentially of using uh, inadequate supplies or fake supplies in, in, in a nuclear power plant, a case that we had recently here uh, in Korea. Democracy is important as a score because we have had dem democracies and non-democracies alike have built nuclear weapons. Democracies and non-democracies alike have joined the NPT. Democracies and non-democracies alike have started nuclear weapons programs and then ended them. But only non-democracies have joined the NPT and then started covert nuclear weapons programs. By my count, there are eight such states. South Korea, very briefly, when it signed. Um, Iraq, Yugoslavia, North Korea, Libya, Romania, Iran, and Syria. So something about non-democratic states that permits their leadership to believe either they won't be punished or that they won't get caught. So one needs to take into account the political characteristics, not just the technical characteristics. So that's point one. We have a severe challenge of governance coming down the road. Point two is that in order to deal with the problem of uranium enrichment and plutonium processing, we need to rethink the central bargain of the NPT. The NPT is often stated to be a bargain between the non-nuclear weapon states and the nuclear weapon states. The nuclear weapon states agree to work in good faith towards the elimination of nuclear weapons. Non-nuclear weapon states agree not to seek or try to acquire them. And in exchange, they get uh, Article 4 rights to acquire nuclear power. If you read the treaty closely, however, you should note that Article 6 of the NPT does not just apply to the nuclear weapon states. It clearly states, and that was the intent, that all members of the treaty must work in good faith towards the eventual elimination of nuclear weapons. And I would argue that the more states that have sovereign, that is, nationally controlled uranium enrichment or plutonium reprocessing, the less likely it will be for the nuclear weapon states to be able to get to very low numbers or zero because they'll be worried about breakout. Seeing that and recognizing that, it seems to me to be clear that the non-nuclear weapon states, instead of just complaining that the nuclear weapon states aren't doing enough to disarm, should take it upon themselves to say, what is our responsibility? And if part of our responsibility as non-nuclear weapon states should be to work in good faith towards having some kind of international control and permanent international control over uranium enrichment and plutonium reprocessing. So I think the Bush administration was, was wrong. It didn't have a legitimate argument to be made to say that, as it tried to argue, that there should be no more states that ever enrich or reprocess. They could make that argument, but it was very hard to make that in a legitimate manner. But what they can say, what all administrations, regardless of whether it's a nuclear weapon state or a non-nuclear weapon state should say, is as we negotiate, and think through what are the future of reprocessing and uranium enrichment in a world with more nuclear power, who will fuel these and how will it deal with the back end of the fuel cycle, 
that one has to work in good faith towards international control and doing it in a permanent manner, with safeguards done in a permanent manner, so that any country that withdraws from the NPT could not benefit legally. That is, it would decrease the incentives to withdrawal and would increase the cost of withdrawal if we have legal mechanisms for permanent international control of uranium enrichment and plutonium processing. And lastly, I want to make one point. As much as I um, think that the Nuclear Security Summit here was useful as a way of measuring and encouraging further implementation of the global reduction of highly enriched uranium around the world, the easiest materials by which to get nuclear weapons. In the future, that can't be enough. And here I point out two points in close here. One is that Fukushima could have been a man-made disaster, not a natural disaster, a point similar to what Peter was just noting. And that terrorists looking at potential targets have a very clear symbol now of what a tax on a, on a uh, spent fuel pond or a sabotage of energy sources into a fuel plant could potentially do in terms of an of a environmental disaster on a facility. So as we think about security, we have to take that into account. And lastly, I would note and end here is that terrorists have not just been interested in attacks on nuclear power plants, and they've not just been interested in trying to get highly enriched uranium, although terrorist organizations are known to have plotted both kinds of attacks. They've also been very creative in trying to think through what other kinds of nuclear materials might be useful for them. For them. And the case in point, I think, is Diran Borat, the Pakistani national arrested by the British, by the British uh, police in 2004, who actually gave a report creatively to Al-Qaeda and briefed it back in Pakistan about how to create dirty bombs using americium out of, um, <coughs> out of uh, alarms, fire alarm systems. Uh, in the trial, he released, uh, they released the information here saying that they were going to try to purchase 10,000 smoke detectors, cost 70,000 pounds, and this is the most chilling last line of a paper I've ever read. Estimated casualties will be in the region of 500 long-term affected if dispersed in a busy area, inshallah. God willing. God willing it will kill 500 extra people. So my points here are that regardless of whether you think we've been delayed by a long time in this train of moving forward with nuclear power or just derailed in a short period of time or a long period of time, we're going to have more nuclear power in the world. And the political characteristics of the states need to be addressed. The international control of plutonium and reprocessing and uranium enrichment needs to be addressed. And nuclear security needs to be much deeper and much differentiated, much more diverse in our strategies than what we've done so far. Thank you, Scott. I'm going to take the... Um Chair's prerogative while all of you are gathering your thoughts for questions. Um, and ask us that, I, I'm intrigued by this um, idea of permanent international control over enrichment and reprocessing. Would you, how do you feel about fast reactors? <laughs> Uh, would you, do you consider that, I mean, usually enrichment and reprocessing are considered sensitive technologies. Fast reactors require reprocessing. Some of them can be configured to breed plutonium. Uh, do you think that the permanent international control of enrichment and reprocessing kind of solves that problem, or would you foresee any restrictions? Yeah, I, I don't have um, technical solutions to a variety of different potential reactors that could, could come down the pipe. Um, what I do object to is the view in some countries that we have a sovereign right to have our own processes regardless of what the international community would think and that we're good on our NPT commitments and therefore leave us alone and don't demand for us to think through these issues. And my only point is a conceptual one, which is the non-nuclear weapon states 
have to take their responsibility more seriously rather than just complain. Even though I've complained about the nuclear weapon states not doing enough as, uh, as well. And so as you design these, whether it's fast reactors or some of the other uh, newfound reactors, one needs to think through how could one guarantee or have some kind of international multilateral ownership of something instead of just national ownership? And how could you have, whether it's Type 66 uh, permanent uh, IAEA safeguards attached to them or some other kind of mechanism that would stop a country from legally withdrawing plutonium for weapons purposes. Because unless there's some kind of permanence attached to that, a country could always withdraw from the treaty and then say, I'm going to use this for nefarious purposes because I have national security need. As long as that problem is not addressed, I can't see how the nuclear weapon states can go below low numbers. And one last question on that. On your permanent international control of enrichment and repressing, does that, are you presuming that you would have some agreement among the nuclear weapon states on a, like a fissile material production cutoff treaty that they would have? That would make it a lot easier. It would certainly make it a lot easier yeah. to get anything like that, yes. Thank you. Dr. Wong, did you want to ask? Yeah. Thank you for inviting me to this uh, panel. Uh, as a nuclear engineer who I am, um, I've been thinking, thinking about that question that you raised over the last 20 years on how we can uh, come up with a technological solution to this uh, proliferation issues in nuclear power industry. And my conclusion is that if it's actually the same as this, we should place all the enrichment and reprocessing under international control. But how can we get there with uh, MPT Article 4 already? Then we should start some small a test bed experiment uh, with uh, a country having leadership in this field to show the world that there is enough uh, incentive to do so. And Belgium has been one of the most important leaders in this field that has been promoting a new technology of fast reactor, not using sodium, uh, using lab business, and burning all the spent nuclear fuel waste and leaving behind only intermediate level waste not the high-level waste. And by using pyrochemical technology, not aqueous technology, and still putting the whole thing under international control, and they open the world uh, to come join this multinational project. And, uh, and I think this is a very significant undertaking that we should pay attention to. And under this new technology, what we can picture uh, 20 years down the road is that having a regional multinational uh, transmutation systems, large scale, a complex. And uh, we have a new technology called the small modular reactors with uh, nuclear fuel that can be burnt for over 10 years when once charged. And then we can take uh, spent nuclear fuels back to those regional centers. So from cradle to grave, we can have full control, but only for those countries who have leadership to join this test bed. And then those leadership should work hard to deliver enough benefit in economy, safety, and environmental impact, I'm sure we'll get positive proof. So we have a kind of mix of technical solutions and institutional solutions. I mean, I, we have 20, uh, 25 minutes or so for questions, so we have plenty of time. Um, I would just ask you, uh, raise your hand and identify yourself and 
hopefully make it a question rather than a comment. This gentleman in the back. I mean, you can make comments too, but it's always nice to have a question. If you could identify yourself too, it would be great. Yeah. Did I not say that? Sorry. <laughs> Um, my name is uh, Don Perrick. I'm a journalist. I just want to ask Mr. Pong a question. One uh, major, huge company here makes all South Korea's reactors. This company has been involved in all kinds of high-level leadership issues in recent years. I wonder, you know, if it's a good idea to concentrate all of South Korea's production of reactors in the hands of this one company. And how can we be sure that this company, as it pursues its export drive overseas, will be observing all the uh, niceties and so forth that uh, you and other members of the panel have been discussing? Thank you. Well, a question about concentrating all of Korea's resources in KHMP. Or KEPCA. Well, it's actually Doosan Heavy Industries. Oh, and oh. They make the reactors. For to to what? What purpose? Well, the, the the question, if I'm phrasing it correctly, is does that constitute some governance issues because of the concentration of all the the technology, mm -hmm. business, everything else? Especially in since this company has been involved in tremendous leadership problems in recent years involving its own family. So. Uh, well, the governance uh, here is just here within the government. This business is a highly political business and a regulatory business. And uh, still, we have good control. It's not out of hand yet. Still, the fuel cycle part is. Uh, very strongly uh, connected to United States. Also, some of the uh, core technology, softwares and control instrumentations are strongly tied to U.S. technology. But your question is, uh, what about uh, 10 years later? And if Korea has a huge uh, the single uh, country uh, residing over all this uh, aspect of nuclear power. Uh, well, I think uh, uh, this uh, I mentioned about the, this year of a presidential election and the uh, test of nuclear power industry and government by public uh, will uh, call for uh, multiple multitude of control mechanisms, both on safety uh, regulation and also uh, the verification of plant operations. So uh, we'll be going into uh, more of control and uh, that control uh, capability will be far above uh, financial leverage of those uh, industries uh, that you worry about. Sir, up front. I'm Dennis Weston for Philip. Uh, is China training enough operators? to actually safely operate all, the, what you say, 26 plants or the reactors that are uh, currently under construction? Uh, it's a great question. It's a great question. Um, probably, I mean, there's a constant, they're trying to constantly train up. Um, there's constantly new university programs opening. Um, there's various um, exchange programs with utilities in the U.S. Um, and there's a huge training center at Daya Bay, which is one of the oldest um, nuclear plants there. Um, my guess is probably for this level, for that 26 under construction, there would probably be enough. 
if they did succeed in going up to 86 gigawatts or 112 gigawatts by 2020, it's hard to imagine they would have those resources. Um, one other question is the, the regulator. Do they, you know, there's this sort of um, salary war between the various utilities trying to get um, experts who can operate their plants, and it's really hard for the regulator to compete with that. I mean, as of two years ago, the regulator only had a couple hundred people regulating the entire operating fleet, as well as this 26, um, 26 reactors under construction, as well as all of the, all of the planning for um, additional reactors. So that's one of the big question marks, and I think that's why this pause, and potentially even after they start restart approvals, the, um, the, the new approval process may be slowed down to, to enable just the, the, the manpower to, to be there. Just one other observation about the Chinese um, program. Uh, in many ways, their concept of building a number of different types of reactors, seeing what works, and then maybe emphasizing that more, has a lot of appeal. But in the context of your question and Philip's answer, not so much because the ability of people to move back and forth among the different reactor designs will be limited. It's the, it's the reason why the hope for renaissance in the U.S. of a few years ago was to be based so heavily on standardization. Um, just get a couple of designs, stick with them rigorously for the moment forget the small modular reactor uh, boomlet, which is kind of a bowling ball through, through all that. But uh, um, the, the, it's hard to see how the Chinese program growing fast with the number of significantly di different designs isn't making that the problem you mentioned more difficult. Other questions? Scott? Yeah, uh, Scott Snyder, this wasn't quite uh, raised by any of the presentations, but I'm wondering about Chinese nuclear plant exports uh, and their implications uh, for the nuclear non-proliferation regime. Let me add to that. And <laughs> um, not just China, but Korea also. I mean, when you look to sort of the next tier of nuclear suppliers, Korea is obviously there, uh, and China, and maybe even India. So if panelists would care. I guess I'll start with China if you want to talk about Korea. Um, the Chinese have been involved in bidding for various projects around the world, um, Lithuania, Turkey, Vietnam, South Africa. But... Um, it was described to me by one Chinese official as sort of just a test run. They're trying it out. It's not clear there's any real government support um, for those exports. And I should stop myself because there have been exports to Pakistan, the Chashma reactors, and they have contracted for more of those. Those are from CNNC, those are Chinese technology, and those um, aren't really commercial operations. Um, obviously those are very important from a proliferation point of view and from the nuclear, the NSG, um, uh, the NSG guidelines about China exporting to Pakistan, which is not an NPT country. Um, and China is arguing that those reactors are grandfathered in um, to, to its agreement when it joined the NSG in 1994. No. It's 2000. That's something. 2004. 2004. <laughs> Um, but I think no one in the Chinese industry really views those as, as, a, as a precedent for um, real commercial exports. Um, so China Guangdong is, is doing these test run bids, but it's very unclear at this point um, whether they can export their main technology, which is the, the CPR-1000. That in itself is derived from the French um, M310 technology, and therefore the French have to sign off on any export they would they would make of that technology. 
And it sounds like the French are not signing off on that. Um, in the case of Lithuania, in South Africa, the Chinese went in and pitched that reactor. And, um, and the French, it's unclear what happened. The French may have objected. The, um, the South Africans may not have been interested in this second generation technology. But whatever the case, now the, the Chinese are going in with the French, with the Riva and the India, for a combined bid, either of some new technology or potentially uh, the French EPR. Um, in terms of, you're asking about non-proliferation implications as well. Um, I don't really see any for this, the, those commercial exports, commercial exports, and um, the Chashma, you know, it depends on whether you buy their argument about the grandfathering. Well, uh, we uh, are very well aware of this issue because uh, we are neighboring with North Korea. And uh, we are highly uh, connected with the United States in all our uh, uh, endeavor in these activities. Uh, also, we import 97% uh, of energy. And we know the energy industry is the largest single industry in the whole world. Uh, the sailing, sales is $10 trillion per year. And next, followed by food industry, which is about the half the size. And the smartphone, electronics, all together is only one quarter of uh, energy industry. <coughs> And we have high trade dependence, about 90%. So uh, Korea will be the last country that will uh, make a mistake in these uh, activities. But uh, as, an, as a nuclear engineer, we see the danger there. In competition process, in the last 50 years, and we saw a lot of fumbles, a lot of uh, uh, shortcut uh, by this uh, industry and it's not properly uh, regulated and uh, that's why India got problem and uh, many countries had problems and in order to uh, prevent uh, the same mistake all over again uh, in this new coming nuclear renaissance in this particular part of the world, which is very vulnerable to that issues because of political instability and also some religious divide. And we need some leadership also in this area, some consensus in not only uh, just principles that just released by Carnegie Endowment, we need some more detailed prescriptive guidelines for all the industry exporters and we also need some uh, peer review process. Even though it's a confidential, all deals are confidential, but we got to have some auditors to interrogate those process, not afterward in proactive way. I agree with you, we have to pay attention, but Korea will be fully cooperating in that respect because we don't want to make any mistake and screw up this whole market. <coughs> Peter, did you want to add something? Uh, actually, much of what I would have said, <laughs> you got wound up, uh, you said is better. Uh, but I, just to expand the point of the, that there is a real tension between competition and the imposition of regulatory requirements of all sorts, not just proliferation. But the competition isn't confined to an expanding number of nuclear export states. It's also competition with other fuels, many of which are getting cheaper while nuclear seems to be uh, either staying expensive or getting even more expensive. So the cost pressure against the very types of safeguards that you Describe is, is great and it's growing, and there's going to be in country after country this tension between uh, saying, "Okay, here are the requirements that will solve this problem," 
and other people saying, ah, but if we do that, we won't build nuclear, we'll do something else, or we won't buy from this country, we'll buy from that one. And how that tension is going to play out is takes us right back into the leadership issues that are the theme of this conference. Mm -hmm. uh, Corey, uh, you, you, let's take two questions at a time now. We have only have about five minutes left, so let's take two at a time. First, Corey, and then Nobu. Up front, up front. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I never want to step in front of Nobu. <laughs> um, my question is for Scott, but um, others may want to weigh in, and it and it plays right on this last point of leadership. You know, we regularly appeal to leadership on nonproliferation and security with regard to nuclear energy, nuclear expansion, fuel cycle, etc. And yet, in this region, I think that leadership is lacking, and there are lots of examples of ways in which the nuclear enterprise could be pursued differently, um, both technically and politically, that would demonstrate real leadership, that would have the opportunity to set good examples, that could set valuable precedents that would allow us to do things in other regions um, or with other countries that um, we currently are a little bit constrained in doing. And so I guess I would formulate the question this way. How can we better articulate the value of leadership, and I mean the practical value uh, of leadership, to countries in this region um, and, 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 and better explain the potential harm that comes to them if they don't exert that leadership? All right, and then Nobu. Thank you very much. Uh, Nova Akiyama from Kitotsubashi University. Uh, two, question, two, two quick questions to Professor Wan. Uh, so regarding the regional uh, multilateral solution for the spent fuel, um, do you think it's really possible to establish cradle to grave solution in East Asia? And if so, how long do you think it takes? And by that time, uh, the, the system was established, how would you deal with the spent fuel in uh, the, uh, the South Korea? And the two, second question is, if the, uh, the South Korea is to uh, de develop its own uh, spent fuel solution, uh, so back end solutions, including the uh, uh, reprocessing and probably uh, uh, the fast reactors. Then, if the, uh, the North South situation is still there, the how would you interpret this uh, North South joint declaration of denuclearization of Korean Peninsula? Okay, so first, convincing. Mm -hmm. Leaders in Asia, the leadership value. Scott, do you want to? Or Peter? Um, I don't think you can. You can't legislate leadership, but I, I think you can try to exhibit. I think the Obama administration has tried to take leadership on the disarmament side, uh, but I think you could do more by taking leadership on changing some of our own rules on the fuel cycle side. So, for example, having a capability to have take back agreements for fuel would create costs. It would be hard for the United States to do, but it would be very helpful in trying to get others to say, for the sake of nonproliferation, you need to have, you need to accept some costs as well. Um, we could have a much greater leadership in terms of having more IAEA inspections on some of our new facilities. That's something that countries will say, well, why should we have new inspections when you're not going to go forward with yours? People say, well, but we don't really need it in the US, but leadership would say, Yes, this would be a, a, a very helpful thing. And last, I just want to know one, one, one point about um, some people have said, well, the real problem is Article 4 of the NPT and the inalienable right for all aspects of the fuel cycle. But the, Article 4 of the, of, the, um, of the NPT does mention inalienable rights. It's unfortunate that they use the um, 18th century concepts of natural rights in the, the Declaration of Independence as if countries have a, a, a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of plutonium. Um, the uh, article actually is, is contradictory. It says inalienable right, conditional upon a state demonstrating that it has kept its Article I and Article II commitments. So to me, unless the IAEA can attest that you have kept all of your Article II commitments, 
you have temporarily sacrificed that inalienable right. And I think we just need to remind people of that. Uh, the question was, yes, the question was uh, whether or not the cradle to grave concept can be uh, materialized in, in the near future. And can Korean really uh, come to a part of this, this approach? Uh, yes. And uh, uh, we have enough technological basis to, to uh, positively anticipate uh, its outcome. And uh, Belgium is testing most difficult part. And uh, this will be done by 2025. Uh, it's a MIRA project, it's an international project to burn uh, all the high-level waste. And uh, if that succeeds, then uh, we can build uh, a regional uh, spent nuclear fuel uh, interim storage, like what we talked about Mongolian Gobi Desert last year, which was uh, punted by uh, mistake. And then, uh, but putting spent nuclear fuel without having long-term promise is uh, unethical, if not illegal. Uh, we have to develop this new technology of eliminating high-level waste and turning them into all medium-level waste. <coughs> and then all those final medium-level waste should be taken back to the country of origin and leaving behind nothing to that host country for spent nuclear fuel depot. And how long did it take? Well, it will take a long time, 30, 40 years. But it will happen far before nuclear fusion takes place. And will be, I can possibly say this, this will be done because <coughs> this will be a big test on peaceful use of nuclear energy. If we fail this, the people will not believe in nuclear energy, and then they think the other way around. The, he also asked about the joint denuclearization agreement. <coughs> what? The joint denuclearization agreement is more of political uh, things. It will be done ultimately, but during this time of having nuclear arsenal in North Korea, it is a very delicate issue, but finally we will get there. Well, at some point, I'd like to hear more about this Belgian process, because I've never heard of any oh, really? recycling technique that totally eliminates high-level waste. <laughs> at some point, you need some kind of repository. So uh, maybe we could discuss that in a coffee break. Um, we are out of time. I wanted to thank you, the audience, for your um, active participation and your patience. Um, and I'd like you to join me in thanking our excellent panelists.